All right. Um, obviously, we're recording now, but hey, I'm back here just like last time with uh, Ryan Carroll from Ronin Jiu Jitsu and MMA in Parkersburg, West Virginia. But uh, before, he's been doing a kind of a series of techniques slash instructionals, just mm -hmm. talking about the game, what's a little bit different. Um, you know, one of the vi last videos that we did was on distance um, striking. Uh, he's going to change it up a little bit. So, but anyway, I'll let him take it away instead of me talking the whole time. But I want to. Go ahead and tell us what you're going to do, and then just jump right down into it. All right, cool. Yeah, so again, I'm Ryan from Ruin and Jitsu and MMA. Um, so in our first segment, we talked about uh, distance management and striking with north, or sorry, with uh, south ball fighters and uh, trying to distinguish on what works best for us and as far as, you know, protective striking versus if we're orthodox or south ball. Um, so kind of going off of that what we're going to do is integrate our distance management and work towards uh clinch work so we're going to use the wall here since i got guys in the cage right now um we're going to use the wall to simulate you know, if you're in a cage fight or if you're just in a fight in general um a, a few different takedowns and control measures that we utilize uh until we even get down to the ground because we all know the fight doesn't start on the ground so we're standing so um when we're going from our different stages, you know, I was talking about the other one, you know, stage one, two, three, and four. Um, stage four being the closest we're at, and we're clenching up and throwing elbows and knees, and we're working more towards our takedowns and control measures, right? So, the angle this just a little bit uh, for us here. So, I got Angie here with us. Um, so, what we're going to try to do right here is so we've worked on our distance management. And, you know, she may be up against the cage or close to the wall of the cage and stuff. And as I'm coming in, so two, two different things may happen here, right? So uh, a lot of times you may have a guy that's bum rushing and coming in. Um, and that's one way, you know, we might get him up against the wall and stuff. But um, my preferred method, obviously, is going through our stages where, you know, we're using, utilizing our kicks and they're backing up. You know, they don't want to get hit. And then, you know, we're moving to stage two for our punches, three. You know, we're working our elbows and our knees, right? And then stage four is where we start to clinch work because once we're here, you know, they're trying to find an escape route, whether if they're against the wall or they're out uh, in the middle of the rain, uh, they're looking for that escape point, right? So we have to cut that corner off and we can do that, you know, if, if we're going to clinch up with them, right? So what I want to do is keep her A from hitting me and also, I want to be able to effectively strike her and set up my own takedowns as well, because if we're in a clinch, then that allows both of us to be able to take and deliver um, elbows, knees, and different things like that. So we don't want to stay in this position very long unless you're in a super dominant position. Uh, but the problem lies, if, if you're already super sweaty, it's so difficult to try to keep a hold of a person because they're sliding around and, and if you, you know that you know, no gi is very difficult to try to keep hold of somebody sometimes just because you're already sweaty, you know, and, and things are, are so slippery at this point. So we have to utilize different measures to keep them from being able to move so we can start working more towards the takedowns, right? So one of the things I like to do, um, and, and we'll go with the South Paul as well and Orthodox, so we'll kind of work both of them here. Um, I'm going to simulate, actually, since the camera is an opposite, um, so I'm going to put my right leg out in front, you put your right leg out in front, right? So, so technically, if we're orthodox, we're both south call, right? Um, we'll kind of work off of this. That way you can see kind of what I'm doing on this side, uh, and then I'll switch it up and kind of go from there. So, again, you know, we've closed our distance. If we came in, we know we're throwing our knees and our elbows. So once I'm in here, I have to neutralize everything again. So I want to make sure I'm neutralizing. <laughs> Typically, I want to get this under hook, behind her back, right, and up underneath her arm. This arm, right, I want to control this hand, okay, so I don't want him to get hit with these elbows, right, so I'm controlling this. Now, I know that if I lean too much to my right, it's leaving this escape route for her. Okay? So, obviously, I don't want to do that. And this applies also if we're out in the middle of the ring, right, so we don't want to give them too much of an angle. So, when I'm in here, go back. So when I'm here, we have to watch our level change, and this is the fight of where I want my shoulder positioning, okay? So whoever's going to be lower is going to have a better uh, result as far as 
uh, how well we're going to be able to control them. Okay. So when I'm in here, my objective is I want to get my shoulder at least at or below mm -hmm. the current platform zone. Okay. So when I'm in here, I'm going to get down and I want to push my shoulder up underneath her own clavicle, okay? And if you don't know what that is, that's that bone, bone cross, right? Your collarbone. So I want to get up under there to control so it doesn't allow her to get her shoulder up underneath, right? So I can use this to push her, okay? So now I'm able to control and punch this part of her arm and her shoulder against the wall so this keeps her from being able to roll out this way, okay? So I'm controlling her from going to her left side, my right, with my underhook, okay? So then we have to control her from going to her right, which would be my left, by controlling this shoulder, okay? So I'm controlling the shoulder by pressure in and controlling that, okay? So I've got to keep pressure and push. Now, if you see my leg, I want to make sure that I get this right leg, whatever leg's forward, okay? I want to get that in there nice and deep and use that shoulder and get my leg in there and I'm pushing off with my back leg. Okay? Now I can start controlling this elbow and this wrist and look, we're going to apply pressure at this point, okay? So once we get here and we've established this, okay, we could throw a little peddly punches and stuff, but the problem is, is if you start trying to really throw hard hits, what will happen is when I step back to throw hard, this opens up that position and allows her to escape, okay? So it's really difficult to try to throw an uh, effective strike from here, but if you feel like you're losing the position, that's where we can start planning for them as they're escaping. So I know if she's coming out here, I'm going to catch her. Okay, so this is where we close one door and make them go through the door that's open, and we're basically setting them up, right? So we want to be here, and if I feel if I'm losing it, I'm just going to pop off, catch them as they come out, I'm shutting this door off, okay? So moving along from there, um, we want to control, nice shoulder from the inside, right, up underneath the clavicle, and control this arm. Now, let's go down the a little bit, that way you can stick this up. So over here, okay. So my legs in there deep. I'm controlling this arm and the elbow, right? So this is what's going to keep me from being hit. Okay. So at this point, now if I want to try for a separate takedown, okay, but I also have to try to control this arm as much as possible. So what I want to do is I'm going to get my hips in, okay. So I'm going to push my hips in deep in my arm that's behind her. I'm going to try and drag it behind and utilize this hand, okay? So I'm going to try to get high up on this forearm. It's going to be hard to grab the wrist, especially if they got gloves on, okay? So I'm going to try to get up on this forearm or elbow and push down. So what I want to do, uh, essentially, right, is I want to push this down and feed it to the arm that's underneath. Okay? That's why I'm keeping pressure in here. I want to keep this arm hidden behind. So I want to push her arm clear to the wall and get like two on one from this point. So now that I can get my two on one and control, now see if I can lean and start getting up in deep. Okay. So now, once I have that two on one and I have a good grip on this hand, I can pull this hand off. So her arm right now is trapped and this arm is right. It's trapped, right? So as long as I'm here, I'm keeping her from pulling both arms out and I want to keep her off balance by leaning that way, right? So I don't want to come back this way. I'm going to take that leg that's up underneath and kick it up to make her lean and start going towards the floor that way. Okay. So this is where we're going to go our takedown at this point, right? So I want to use that two on one push, get my shoulder in, get in there deep. If I have to, this hand can be free because I've still got that one hand in there. And it stays nice and tight because her body and my body pushing against both of our hands keeps this in there nice and tight. This allows me to open up her strikes at this point. And if she screws up and pulls this hand over, right, now we have more of an option to start taking it back. Okay. So she pulls this arm over, thinking, well, you know, she can get an elbow or something, whatever. Um, and typically that might be the case because once you get to this point, you're in a weird <laughs> position and you don't want this arm to be stuck because if you're hitting them, they're going to pull that arm out to block yourself, right? And that's what we want. We want them to have to block themselves and pull that arm free. Now I can utilize this to my advantage. So not only do I have this one handed and I've got her basically up on one leg, right? She's toning on this one leg. Now I can use my free hand, not only to strike, but I'm going to set up where I want this hand to go. 
So I want to go up here. I'm going to strike her down here. Right? So she's going to cover it down, which allows me to go to the top. Okay. And that's where that's really where I want to be. I want to start working towards her back into here. So even if I've only got one arm over, okay, now since she's leaning on that one leg, this allows me to pop my back leg out and start taking her back. Okay. Once we get to here, then obviously it's going to be a, a, a big scramble, but the fact that I can still have my one hand on her and one hand around her neck, this only gives her one arm to fight really with. And if I can keep this in here, now I can start working towards her back. So if you remember in the last video, right? So we had the one arm to keep her from turning. Once I get to here, I start throwing that leg through. Okay. Then we can start working off this. So I can control them hips control this arm so she can't turn to her right and she can't turn to her left, right? Then we can slowly start taking them down or taking them down hard. So if we're facing the cage wall like this, right, so I've got to get away from the wall or let her start scrambling around, then I can slowly pull her back, okay? And that's where our take is going to happen so I can control this and this. So I'm going to control this leg and pull. Hey guys, one quick question for when you get up here. Um, are people still using your round timer or no? If they're not, can we turn it off? If they are, it's no big deal. I'll, I'll work through it. No big deal. Nope. So, also, too, just let me give you a quick comment, too. Like, um, I, this is, in my opinion, um, and probably I'm biased, but this is phenomenal instruction. The reason I say that is typically, when people get on the cage or even in boxing and they put them on the ropes or just whatever most people just say turn him turn him right so they work from an over under and the stronger guy turns the weaker guy realistically like like i've been in a fight game since 1997 okay um meaning that and, and I've, i'm guilty of giving the same instruction right is like two guys they have a basic over under Right, so you have it. We're we're fifty fifty because we both have an over under, and literally people just yell, "Turn him, turn him!" And there's not a lot of instruction involved. So I really like the way you're talking about having your leg placement. You're talking about shoulder placement more so than more, most people. Um, so anyway, major props to you. Continue on. Um, again, I only want to stop because you're doing such a good job. I really. There, there's probably there's not a lot of technical information from an over under other than wrestling like people get in the same position they do arm drags they do lateral drops they do this and that um i'm not saying there's no information out there on the clinch there is there's just not a lot right and so especially on our level this is something that your friends could see my friends people that go to the gym uh great job man so yeah keep it up man it's good material so and kind of follow along with that like so we'll, we'll do a lot of these actually. Um, I, I force them to do a lot of times. Um, we do wall drills uh, on an almost continuous basis. Like, uh, so we'll do like one minute rounds, uh, one on the wall and one up against them. And, and basically we work this whole thing, you know, and I don't care if it's first strike or not, whatever. Um, I think being is you're just trying to get into the ground um, within that, and you're trying to get into as many times as possible within that one minute time frame, And then, you know, we'll take like a 10 second break and switch. And then just basically do like a round robin that I do um, where everybody gets a chance and a feel for how to protect yourself from being taken down, how to find different ways and, and different body structures and everything. Um, so it, that's something that we have to do a whole lot of really. Um, so it's really not too, too new to you guys. I don't think, I don't know if you have or not. Um, one thing yeah, I'm uh, sad about is that uh, Brett Monbach is not there wearing the same pants as these two girls because he did yesterday. And that's really sad for me. But anyway. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, but so go, what I want you to do is switch for a second. I just kind of want you to go through that way they have a different perspective um, from just watching my face doing it. Um, just so you can kind of see. You know, and I can kind of walk you through in case you do screw up something, right? Um, but I just kind of want you to go through the same motions as well, you know, um, getting your over under uh, control to that takedown. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 you'd be starting your over unders, right? You're getting your arm up underneath. Ah. Ah. Your 
left hand, you got to get that under hook. It's going for a single. And if that doesn't work, then what happens is, is this is kind of where it falls into the line of um, our orthodox versus our southpaw, right? So, and, and this is what happens. Um, and this is part of the instruction. So, basically, what you were doing was correct. And, and, and so what happens is this, you're, you're fighting this direction, right? And you were going for this single leg, okay? So if she's leaning this way so much, if, if you're losing it, then that's just when we start to switch, right? So our over-unders, where we start to switch it up and we change uh, direction on it, okay? So if, so if I'm, if I'm in there and I'm going this way and I can't get this, whatever, and I, even if I got this, so this is where we start to switch. So if I'm losing this battle, okay? Just like I was talking about where we're going our South Paul and Orthodox, we're just going to switch it up because a lot of times they're going to be weaker on one side than the other. Plus, if their momentum is already going one way, now I've got an advantage to be able to get the shoulder up underneath and I'm just turning. So now I can start working it in. Okay, so now it throws her a little bit more off balance because she was already in one direction. Okay. So. <laughs> Questions? Questions? Okay, so, sorry, I have people here too. Um, just making sure they didn't have any questions as we were going along as well. Um, so kind of moving on from, from that, um, we're just going to show a couple different things because I don't want to over bombard too much. Um, so we're back in the same situation, right? We got our over under, I want to get control, get my shoulder up nice and deep, okay? So instead of, if I can get this arm back like I wanted to, and if she's just being deleterious and keeping this up here tight, but so if, if this is in here tight and I can't push that back to get that two on one, okay, so now what I want to do is this arm that's behind, I'm going to shoot it across the wall or the cage, okay? And when I do, my leg that's up underneath, I've got to kick it out as well, so I'm forcing her body to go in this direction, okay? So uh, sometimes, you know, it's going to be a, a couple little jars, maybe just one or two. Um, you can do it a couple times. Um, but the idea is, is that when I'm in here, I want to get nice and deep and I'm going to start shooting this hand up, which throws her other body off first. Then I can start working this leg in and start kicking it up. So basically, I'm wall walking down this way and I'm more on balance because I'm pushing onto her body. Then all we're going to do is we're going ankle pin. Okay, so all her weight's in this direction. And obviously, you don't want to do it this slow. Um, but as you're doing it, you know, you're going in this direction. Then, after I've got that leg where it's kicked up, come back down and grab on the outside. Okay, we're going thumb out. I'm just going to hook that ankle where Achilles is. We're going to pull it like a lawnmower. Okay, and that allows us to take him down. So, if we're, let me switch out from that here. Oh, you're fine. Um, just kind of rotating everybody around that way. So it makes it a little bit easier too. That way you just have to fall. <laughs> so again, same thing. He's fighting this underhook a lot. I can't get this in there. So I've got to get in here deep and punch this up. Okay? So this is going to help break free on that. And I've got to get this leg in and kick that up and then replant it. So once I'm planted here, his body's basically on my thigh. Okay? Then that allows me his legs are in a weird compromised position, okay? I'm just grabbing that ankle and yanking her up. It, it can be a controlled movement um, with your partner. Uh, it doesn't have to be super hard. Even if you do it hard, you know, all you're doing is switching that leg out from underneath. And honestly, um, that's very good. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, I did, you know. So, chest on in to be easy. Oh. Chelsea on in, Habib Nurmagomedov, um, and Daniel Cormier are huge on this. So when they get the show like out here, instead of just having an underhook like this, they reach for the ceiling with it, and make sure you keep straight fingers for MMA because you don't want to think that you're grabbing the cage. But they'll shoot their arms straight up because a lot of times those bigger guys they can't they can't get that leg trapped in the air. So that's why I can dog. So when you're here. What they do is they shoot this arm up like this to the ceiling, and that keeps them much easier to bring them this way. So if I'm just here and I barely have his leg up off the ground, I can either go for that ankle pick or I can switch. Like if he's fighting wrist here, 
if you're cutting wrists here, I can switch it and just go for a knee, at least a knee pick right here. And all I'm doing is just blocking it here. And then they're just essentially kind of running forward. They're just so falling here. Probably hard to see exactly how we land, but we landed in half guard. But that is where Habib and BC, they, they stress all the time in their videos that I've watched to bring that all the way up if you're fighting somebody a lot stronger than you, yeah. or if you're fighting somebody that's just really pretty good at wrestling. Yeah. And, and you, you'll run into them a lot, uh, a lot of strong wrestlers, especially when it's in that situation. Um, you know, they're, they're really good at the run, uh, protecting themselves from being taken down, you know. Um, it's a tough situation to be in. I try to work with people when I wrestle them. Yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, it, it, it's hard to, you know, especially when you're so slick. Yeah, it's, it's so damn difficult. Uh, you know, uh, so we're wrong. Let's, uh, is there any questions off of that kind of stuff? I know um, it's all relatively the same. Um, it's not super, super uh, technical. It's just kind of things that people uh, may forget about or don't really uh, think about working on, you know. And it's just those little things of, you know, your leg placement, shoulder placement, um, your hips and everything else, um, and trying to just control them, um, honestly, because that's what this all boils down to, you know, is, you know, our distance management, and then we're controlling them from moving to the left or to the right. You know, we don't want them running away, but if they do, we want to make sure that that way that they're going is the way that we want them to go so we can catch them as they're exiting that door. Um, and, and, you know, in boxing and kickboxing or whatever, um, in a stand-up game, we do the same thing. Um, you know, if we have someone against the wall or, or in a corner or something like that, whether uh, they're in boxing, um, if we want them to go in this direction to our right, you know, we, we try to cut off this side. So even if there's only a limited amount of space, I want to make sure that he's not going to go this way. So anytime he starts to come this way, I'm going to constantly tap him, right? So I want to force him to come to my right, which in turn, that's my power side. So as I'm doing this, I'm setting him up to come this way, which will allow me to return. So the same instance applies when it comes to our takedowns and stuff off the cages and everything. Um, and you see a lot of guys do it, um, you know, I don't know if he's, he's more of a straight in kind of guy, you know, I'm, I'm not, I can't think of who really does a lot of angle he's, stuff. Yeah, he's super strong. Um, he's more your, your double leg kind of guy. Um, me, yeah, I, I'm not much of a double leg kind of person. Um, I prefer to work from the top down instead of the bottom up, but that's just me. You know, like a single leg. Have you done? Have you seen that single leg where you lift people off the cage? Mm -hmm. That's my favorite. Or just your uh, high cross type stuff. Yeah, he basically just high crosses them and just lifts them straight up. Yeah. Um. So basically, if you don't know what they're, uh, what we're talking about, um, a, a lot of this stems from the same kind of situation, you know, um, where it, it, again, you know, if my right leg's out, his left leg's out, so we're kind of in the same. Uh, position we were talking about last night um, as far as orthodox and southpaw positioning um, and this is where it'll kind of come into play and you have and this is where you have to be um, ambidextrous as far as this goes because you can't rely on that leg that you always want to be out front because it may not always be that way so for me you know if his left leg's out my right leg's out so real sick yeah um so i want to get this leg not on the inside i prefer it to be on the outside if i'm lifting Right? Um, I mean, if you took that, would you took it right in? I don't know. If, if I was, well, I'm not sure which way you're talking about, but like for me, um, it's almost like my high cross, right? So I, I, I stay in like this, and keeping them in, I'm going to pull this leg out and come up underneath here. That way, now I can come into high cross here. So even though I'm letting this go, I've already got this leg where it's coming around and stepping behind where I can get my hips up underneath his hips. Okay. If I, have, if I can, I feed this to here. Again, we'd be working off that two on one. If not, that's fine. You know, I can still work off this and I'm going to need a shot or two. But essentially what I'm wanting is in here and here so I can drop down and lift, right? And then we go dump. Um, that's probably go as far as that is. Um, you have a different method? We don't have another one. I would do. 
talking about sitting here in your original position with your arm up high. I'm just curious when you step back, since you're already back here, once you come down for your high crotch, mm -hmm. I always notice some rest boys put their right knee in. They'll come here, and as soon as they're here, they'll step that right knee in. As soon as they step in, it's just an easy. Yeah. Oh, they're basically suplexing, you know. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think it all derives down to, I guess, your own background. It's, um, it's kind of like if you don't ever do double legs or single legs or anything like that, then you expect to try to do it in the middle of a fight, it's not going to work. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're going to screw up so bad. Um, you know, the best way you can tell somebody that doesn't have shit, you know, keep it back straight. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you'll see somebody hunch back, you already know they don't, they don't know. Hunch shit. And, and that's the thing, guys. Like, if, if you're trying to plan on expanding, uh, your knowledge for like takedowns and stuff. Definitely look into uh, some wrestling type takedowns as well. You know, your single legs and double legs, just your basic kind of stuff. Hands up. Um, and, and that's one of the major things, you know. Um, don't lift anybody, you know, with your, your shoulders hunched over, you know, your back bent. Um, there's so many bad um, things that can happen by doing that. You know, not only are you going to hurt your back, but you're just not getting your power by keeping your back straight and lifting your legs to be able to get them. Um, so that's one of the major things, you know, is I can show you uh, the, the finer points of this, but until you actually go out and practice, you know, your single legs, your double legs, high crotches, you know, those three things, and they don't have to be all so fancy. Um, just get familiar with them and then find a partner to be able to practice these with. Um, and then, so one of the other things um, that we'll work with is you know, uh, we do like arm drags, right? So if he's against the log cage, right? So if I can't necessarily keep him in here, uh, and, and this is coming from an opposite point of view, okay? If I'm in here and I've got pressure on him and I'm trying to get inside, you know, if I'm striking, you know, and he might be good at blocking and stuff. So he's going to take whatever arm and he's going to find his way out. Right, so on the opposite end of the spectrum, if I'm attacking him, okay, he's he can easily arm drag me to try to get out because this is one of the easiest things to do. He's just pulling me back to the cage and he's escaping, right? So it's very simple, you know. You may eat a shower too, but as that hand's coming in, right, then he can essentially start taking my back, just get out back in the middle of the cage because if he doesn't want to stand there and wait for me to try to take him down and stuff. You know, that's essentially all you have to do, honestly. You know, there's nothing super fancy about it. You know, even if you're just walking and you're just taking them, and he's just taking them, all he has to do is wait that one. Boom. As soon as I reset or whatever, he can be done and out. And, you know, I'm not doing much damage at all. You know, the ref or whoever might be, you know, saying work, work, work. But as long as you're intelligently defending yourself, you know, there, there's not a lot that they can do as far as, you're blocking, you're defending, you know, you're going to take a couple shots, but don't take a, a, a crap ton, right? Um, and that's the main thing, you know, don't take a whole bunch, but now, you know, it, it does change the dynamic if I do happen to get in there and start working that over-under and getting that shoulder pressure in and nice and low. So now it's really difficult for him to try that arm drag, right? Because my arm's up underneath him, okay? So it, once we get into this point, you know, it's a matter of we're going to be fighting for our over-unders. You know, he's trying to get it. I'm trying to get it. We're trying to control, you know, our top pressure. So as long as I can stay low up underneath, again, his collarbone, then I should be in a better position than him. Okay? So one of the things that we can do while we're in this position, so if his right leg is out, okay? So push here. Put your right leg out. So his right leg's out. He's bent. Okay? So if I'm in here... And we're trying to get this so we can play a little bit of sneaky with him. And it's real simple, okay? So we're here, his right leg's out, he's posting hard, and I'm nice and low upon him, okay? But I can't really do a whole lot. So what I want to do is I want to change his weight distribution, okay? So right now I'm pushing a whole lot on his chest, trying to keep his back against the wall, making sure I'm not getting hit. But what I essentially want to do is I want to make sure that he has a good amount of weight on his front leg. This is going to allow me to be able to sweep him a little bit easier, okay? And how we do that, I want to control this elbow, okay? So as I have control of this, not only, again, I want to keep him from punching the elbow, 
or anything to my head, right? So I'm controlling this. And as I'm keeping pressure in, all the weight is pretty much on my left foot, my back foot, okay? And I'm pushing pressure in. Now, once I'm ready, I'm going to pull a little bit forward, okay? What happens when I pull a little bit forward, this weight comes forward on this front leg. And that's what I want. As I pull forward and that weight comes forward, okay, I'm going to do a simple sweep behind his Achilles, okay? And I'm going to pull it almost at an angle behind me. Okay, I don't want to pull it to my side. Right? So I'm going to take my right leg and get behind that foot and pull where I can push. Okay. So it, it should be just when I'm in there, right? So I'm going to push, get control, and then I'm going to pull forward. And if I can't get this leg far enough, right, so I have to wait and get him to pull this leg forward. Okay. So once I pull it there, we're going to see now his, his weight from forward. That's what I wanted. Now, when I do it a second time, okay, the first time, it placed his foot where I want it. Now, the second time, I'm going to pull again to where that weight comes forward, and then I can start working on this sweep, right? Because what happens is, even if I screw up on this, so say if I pull here and I miss, I can still back back out, right? Or I can tally, you know, and start. So if I pull the board, get that weight forward, come back, pull them again, and get up on my feet. You see, my legs hooking behind that foot, and I'm going to push again with my right arm that's underhooking, drive them forward. Okay? Basically, winding up in a half guard type situation. Okay? So that's a couple. So one other small minor detail, which is a huge detail, really, um, is. Good thing you got it. So, uh, you don't pay attention to it unless you're really watching close uh, and seeing what's happening. Okay, so if you're having a difficult time and the guy's really, really stronger or he's pressuring you or something like that, so what we want to do is when I get in here, okay, if I want to try to control him a little bit more and I can't get my shoulder in here, okay, so we're fighting out here, but I really can't get my shoulder pressure in. And he's leaning on me, so I'm going to get my head up underneath his neck and chin and push him back. So now, you don't have control of that head. So as I have him here, look, no matter how big and strong he is, when his head's pushed back, it makes it easier for me to start controlling his arm. He's thinking more about this. This is well, it's pretty uncomfortable. Huh? Uh, it's annoying. It's uncomfortable. You're not headbutting him. You're just keeping your head up. And if he moves his head, we just follow him around. He turns it to the right and keep it here. Right, he turns it to the left. So if he, if he can't see, he's kind of up on his toes. His legs are straight. That's what I want. I'm just applying pressure here. Now, uh, if you're doing enough wrestler and your takedowns are good, when we've got him posted up, that's when we can drop down quick enough and go for that double or single, right? And that's what we want. We want to apply pressure up here. Again, this is all in the striking and judicial and everything else. And that Houdini effect of make them Thing to worry about something else in a different position so we can attack the opposite thing that's happening. Right? So we don't want him to think that I want to go for a leg. I want him to think that this is just uncomfortable and how in the hell do I move his head off of my chin and throat? Because this is just being uncomfortable, right? So even like this, and you've got to think too, if the body's straight up, it makes it way more difficult to protect yourself from strikes. If my arm's under and I still control him, look, I'm controlling this wrist, I can strike, boom, boom, right? We can go to the body because, again, he can't protect his body very well. In order to protect that body, we got to kind of crunch down and squeeze our stomach muscles. So if I'm in here and I'm pushing and, and grinding my head in here, I'm shorter, so it's going to benefit me a little bit more, and it's just painful and annoying for him. Then I can start working the body, right? And that's what I want. Then I can start working that thing down. So once I hit him, okay? See where my head's at, right? So my head's still side of his. I'm still applying this pressure. Now, if I pull my head off, this allows him to come in close. But I've lost that battle. Okay. So I have to keep this pressure in him. So even if he goes back way, right, pushing forward, I'm still keeping his head pinned back there. Okay. Even at this point, he still really doesn't have much. If I'm keeping my hips in tight, I'm applying pressure and the other side of his head. Not pushing any eye. So, that's where I want to be. 
So no matter what he does at this point, he's not in a good situation. He's got to basically wall off and start trying to get himself back up and keep from me applying too much pressure. Then look, okay, then we can start wrapping them up. And that's what I want. So once I get to there, we can start that wrap. You know, we can start our navel grip, get that in tight. If he stands up, look, we're right into there again. Okay, we got our head and arm triangle. And this is one of my favorite things for striking, especially up against the cage. Okay, we get him in this position, and I know I mentioned we won't get the side, but if we move to the front, and I've got him in this, switch here. So if I've got him like this, and we move to the front, and his back's against the cage, what happens is, again, I'm protecting myself from being hit. Two, he has nothing to protect this side of his body at all, right? So especially where his liver is, this is a prime opportunity for me to strike. Now granted, I've got to keep this table grip, okay? So when I do again, you don't want to bend your back, keep your back straight and your butt out, so I can still apply pressure here, okay? But when I, what's happening is, is I'm stretching these muscles and all these rib cages, okay? Ideally, what I'm trying to do is just pull him down enough to pull this knee up into him. So when I put down, I'm able to strike. So he can't protect that hand, would have to come clear over here to try to block, right? So if your hand shoots through here, okay, so even if it's here and I pull him down, that's not going to protect anything because he really can't see where that leg's going. So I can come here and I'm still going to hit his hand, right? So they're still going to go through and catch it. So even if he's blocking, right, we go five, body, and then back up into here again. Okay, keep that pressure, utilize that, get back up in here again. I think that's a, <clears throat> a good position, meaning that that's a, uh, a great Muay Thai clinch uh, position. Um, one of a lot of people when they're uh, – pummeling inside and outside trying to get the plumb position right or the you know two hands behind the neck that's another position a lot of times that people kind of I would say avoid a little bit not avoid meaning that they don't want to go there but I mean um, they don't recognize it so a lot of times if that arm is just like you said you can tr you can trap that arm on the top and really expose the side of the ribs or so you know I mean all that stuff that you're doing right there essentially obviously that's off the cage a little bit different than straight up Muay Thai clinch but it's a a great mix of the two. Um, so anyway, I like that. But the other question I was going to ask you real quick is how, since it's a hot topic, I guess, really not a hot topic, we're like a month late or something like that. But so it, it, let's say that we're in a lot of those same positions that you're in right now. So two questions I'm going to ask. First one is kind of a, not really a joke, but it's, you know, it is what it is. But what do you think about the Muay Thai or not? I'm sorry. What do you think about the Conor McGregor shoulder strike from there? You know, honestly, uh, it's just like I was saying um, when it comes to striking. You know, foot stomps. I'm all about it. Like, if if I'm going to be in that mindset that I'm using my head, why not use that shoulder, right? So if I'm if I'm here, you know, and if he pops off, right? So if I'm keeping my shoulder down up underneath his, yeah. I mean, so if I'm going to utilize in this position, so what I'd have to do again is I might pop it out and then pop up. Because if I'm just here, for me, I'm so I'm, a, I'm so much shorter than him, so I have to kind of bring down my level. If I just try to hit him here, and he just leans back, I'm going to miss. So I can't really hit him hard. Right? So for me, I'm pulling down, but most definitely, like shoulder strikes in this position, like I'm going to stomp that foot and pop it. Absolutely. Um, I think that's super effective, you know, and, and, you know, not giving them too much credit, but, you know, bring it back to the old school UFC, you know, that was some stuff that we used back then that people just absolutely forgot about. And then, you know, the intelligence of using it then, because, you know, it was a, again, an unorthodox striking method that we don't train for, you don't expect it. So when it's not expected, yeah, I mean, it's super effective. Like, I mean, that's a bone on the bone. much where if I, if I, if we're both in a neutral position you know 
even him, he can utilize it because if I'm here, you know, and neither one of us can really, we're so close that even knees and strikes or elbows or punches isn't going to be super effective. But by God, that shoulder right there is enough to at least jar me to where if he's in a bad situation and he just pops that shoulder off, I'm going to come back. You know, and that's all he needs to start gaining, whether it be another underpoke or start escaping. Um, that's a prime time to be able to, you know, utilize everything that you have. I mean, headbutt, by God, you know, you got your shoulders. And it's kind of like uh, the old concept of this. People will think it's stupid. Um, or, again, like you were saying, they don't really think about it. It's striking, you know, different parts of the body. Um and utilizing, you know, like elbows against your, you know, if I'm, if I'm striking and if I can't reach his head, but, you know, if you kick, you know, in, in the bicep area enough, it's going to cause damage to that area where they can't utilize it, you know, just like our, our thigh kicks, you know, our leg strikes, you know, it's the same thing. So if I'm in a clinch of some sort, you know, or, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm here just trying to get my pack and I can't get this Kamara grip, but I, all I have is this, Elbow, I'm going to elbow the shit out of that bicep and that tricep because my little bony elbow, oh, he's going to move. Like, he's going to let go. Like, and it's stupid shit that people don't think about because you'll see all the time they're here and they're like, ah, oh. and all he has to do is put his head on the opposite side of my shoulder. I'm wasting energy. And what will happen here is if I'm doing this, he's taking advantage of me and he can throw me and pick me up whatever. Right? But if I stay in my position and utilize my tools, Right? So if I'm here and I'm keeping good pressure and I'm not letting him get his hips up under me, but I see that this elbow's here, this forearm's here, his biceps here, right? You can't tell me that in the midst of something, I'm going to strike. Ooh, that's going to take away his grips right there <clears throat> automatically. I don't care who you are. Like those little short elbows, he's going to pull out and then we can retaliate because he's going to be on my left, right? Because if I'm here, I might throw one here, get his head moved. Then I'm going to sit back here, here, catch him coming out, right? And even if it's just to get you off of me, it's going to be super effective. You know, I don't care who you are. Um, that, yeah, like it, it makes those little weird nerves tingle. Um, so I'm all about shoulder strikes and elbowing, you know, the little bony parts of our body against, you know, the, the small little muscles and tendons and stuff. I mean, it's, it's effective. It's been proven years and years and years, you know, decades. Um, you know, that's kind of, I guess, if you're going back to old school, you know, uh, Shurikan and Shotokan and, you know, all the other ninjutsu type stuff was, you know, attacking this weird thing. Um, but as far as, like, shoulder strikes, elbow strikes to those weird parts of the body, by all means, all about it. Like, guys will, you'll see it, you know, they'll at least elbow people in the thigh and stuff, um, which, you know, that's just a huge muscle that you can take a lot of strikes to it, especially if it's just you know, your elbow, but, you know, if you're on elbow anywhere, you know, that's my great area. I can't get to his head. <clears throat> And that's perfect, too. Like I said, it was kind of a joke, but kind of not, because it is a serious thing. The only reason I brought it up is it's the same reason I bring up, um, we've kind of joked about it before, but where Stefan, uh, not Stefan, but um, whatever his name is, the uh, the Aikido guy that has movies. What's that guy's name? Steven Seagal? Yeah, that's it. So where he said he invented the front kick, right? So like, like the only reason I bring that up is because for gen generate, and I'm not saying he invented the front. He tried to pretend he invented the front kick for the face. Uh, for oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Match, right? Um, you know, and I have video of our fighters doing that way before, you know, 10 years before that fight. It's not, he didn't invent crap, right? We've been doing that forever. Um, but anyway, that's why I brought it up because it's a hot topic because maybe somebody forgot about it. And that, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying is that's why this is a good position because a lot of people know um, the clinch and they maybe even know this kind of wrestling position, meaning the underhook. Um, but then they know, they know limited stuff, right? They know pummeling. Um, they know turning the person. But not like a whole lot of stuff. And then, and then to separate that, there's a difference between wrestling. There's a difference between MMA. There's a difference between jujitsu in the same underhook position, and even self defense for that matter. Um, so, kind of going off of that same thing, that there's a difference. What do you think about when you have the underhook grasping your opponent's shoulder 
compared to having the underhook in reaching behind their back, whether it's a high underhook, a low underhook or whatever. Um, Cause there's a lot of guys that love the underhook, which, and then again, grasping the shoulder deltoid, however you want to put it, and then kind of doing a game from there. What do you think? Yeah, I, I don't have high amount of success with that. Um, just for the simple fact, so, um, you know, take these off the safety back seat. Um, and only because if you if you have a, a high, um, high caliber of a wrestler, um, for instance, and, and they know how to um, shoot. I just had a brain fart. Uh, oh, what's the word? Um, I'm going up Matt. What's that? What's uh? What's that word? Um, shoot. Wither. Wither. Golly, I don't know how I forgot that. So, That's right. I couldn't remember Steven yeah. Seagal either. So we're good, man. It's all right. Yeah. Um. So you, you may have a higher caliber guy. Um. And and for me, you know, if so, we'll kind of fix this right here. So if my arm is up like this, right, like you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he goes to whisper me, right? So he takes that. My shoulder is almost in a mirror lock at this point. Like, and that's that for me just absolutely is horrible because even if I'm trying to do this and control him, when he has that, and if you guys don't know what a mirror lock is, right? So it's basically just pulling that elbow straight to the tire across my body, right? So it's a terrible shoulder lock. Um, granted, you know, you don't see it a lot in MMA. Um, well, yeah. You, you don't anymore, but it is named after a guy from MMA, right? So. Exactly. Yeah, people don't yeah. really know that. <laughs> yeah, um, Pete Williams, Frank Mir. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, so for me, I don't utilize it just because I've been caught in that weird situation. Plus, um, if he starts to wizard me, you know, um, I'm able to start getting my arm out a little bit easier. So if he drives my shoulder down to the ground, I can lamp it out and start pulling it away. Granted, I'm exposed my back a little bit more, but I'd rather do that than if he whispers me and my arm's caught in a weird position. Because now, you know, I'm just off balance and then, you know, I look like shit. <laughs> As, if my arm's up under here and he's trying to whip me, I can almost kind of strong arm me or I can get down back up underneath him and get my shoulder back in and try to fight it back off. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, so is, that's a great point because, um, yeah, you guys don't have to keep hugging, so it looks not awkward. But um, so years ago, um, John Jones fought the guy that fought the other night, and obviously my brain's not clicking tonight, so I apologize. But what's to say that again? Nagano. No, no, the guy that fought Smith. The guy that won, the Brazilian guy that I should know that was the main event. You know, saying like Glover took Sarah. Glover. I'm sorry, my yeah. brain's not working tonight. I apologize. But anyway, that is essentially what really screwed Glover up for years because John Jones caught him in so called mirror lock, jacked his shoulder up, and then for the end of the fight, he was useless, right? So, oh, and, I, and the reason I bring that up is because that's a good point because I never actually thought about it. The reason I don't think about it, two things, is typically when I'm looking at you two guys, right, there's a definite size advantage. So usually bigger guys go for that against a smaller guy, right? It's a self-defense move, really. I teach women that all the time. Like if I grab your hair, turn around, throw that lock on, right? Um, yeah, so, and I think, so that's one reason. But the other reason is too, like if he commits both his arms against yours, then a lot of guys are afraid to get elbowed in the face or punched in the face with the free arm. However, listen, people that don't fight, say that stuff all the time right like somebody will be in an arm bar and they'll be like why don't he just stomp on his face why don't he just punch him right? it's not how stuff works right so it's easy to say like if i'm caught in a you know so-called mirror lock why don't you just punch him well if your arms get ripped off you're just worried about your arm getting ripped off right yeah people don't think about the pain tolerance i mean yeah if you have like super flexible shoulders and you don't mind your rotator cuff by all means you know eat it and try to punch him, but, you know, physically saying, you know, from a physical point of view, like my body won't allow me to be in a proper position, even, even to remotely like strike him. Cause once he starts that, you know, like my hips are already down or they're, they're coming up. So I have no power here. So I can punch him as hard as I could, 
but my hips can't move. This is all, this is nothing but shorter. So I guess maybe if I was a 300 pound man or, you know, 250 and I had really awesome strength in my arms, I might be able to get some weird haymaker off. But if he just leans back, because when he's putting his power on, he'd be leaning back anyway. I can't hit him hard enough to do anything. Like even if I try to not get caught or, or anything, like the fact that he's got my elbow in such a weird position. So I really can't retaliate that well. The most I can do is try to bear down and get this hand back up in here to where I can get my hips turned toward him. Yeah. But if he's already got that elbow of his past his point of, of hip control, right? So once he starts pulling that up, I pretty much lose all faith in humanity. No. Uh, yeah. Like, I mean, to me, that just sucks. You know, yeah, my – It does. Like, if it's a big guy like this, like, I would try some stupid fancy shit. Like, do a if he's going to strike an order like that, like, I would try, you know, going almost – um, like if he was, you know, to get a stamp on it. Like if he was trying to really crank on it, I would almost utilize this to try to get a uh, inverted like triangle or some stupid shit. Like especially a bike, you know, like. No, I wouldn't think of. No, I got, I, I got you. That's why I say I was jokingly say do a backflip. I would not well, do. No, that's, that's what I would do. Like I would grab back his head and I would use his shoulder as an anchor. So as yeah. he's pulling on me, I'd be. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> I but promise that's... you, this is no offense, but I promise you, he's not going to do that. No, <laughs> and no offense, I'm a big guy like you. I'm, I'm just starting out. There. I'm not going to. I would love if I could, but if I did that or you did that, and I expect and you expected Ryan to hold you up in the air, you probably break your neck, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, that's the beauty of being you. No, honestly, that's that's a great stuff. I, I like what you did. I mean, I agree. So the point, really, your point is that's why you don't like that. <laughs> so that's yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. No, don't I, like I, that, yeah. Look, I don't have – so here's the thing. As a non-wrestler, I don't have a great answer for that, right? I've been taught um, underhooks from every position, meaning – it could be from starting from low to mid back to high back to the deltoid. And the reason you go more higher, even if you're, if you're can not talking the deltoid is because it's high, it's harder for them to wizard and counter. Right. Um, I would think, and this is a guy that doesn't do these things. So, I, and I'm admitting I'm, I'm not a wrestler. I never was. Maybe your, your object is if you grab the deltoid, if that was your game is to keep your head tight to the other guy so that he couldn't get distance. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I we kind of skipped over that area of like. No, that, I mean, that's okay. Kind of like, if that's not your game, that's not your game. Like, right? You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't matter. Like, you you decided that's not your thing. Um, it yeah. doesn't matter. Like, you might know that the the reason why you don't, but it doesn't matter. It's not you because you're like, well, this is a lock that I don't want to deal with, so I don't do that. I have the same move, so like, I get what you're saying, a hundred percent. I mean. Um, and this is again. I'm not saying you're right or wrong because this I do some a little bit, some some way, some that. And lit, and half the time I, it, I don't you know I'm not having a pre-planned. I, as soon as I get it underhook, I'm just doing what I do, <laughs> right? I'm yeah, not like, exactly. here's my you're thing. But what you're doing, you know? I'm yeah, sure. I'm also admitting that I'm not the best wrestler and the best underhook. You know, I mean, I've I've got a, uh, I've got an adequate game from there, but I don't have you know if I went this is unrealistic, but if I went with Randy Couture, who has a strong, you know, which again, I don't need to be against Randy Couture because some Joe Schmo off the street can beat me, but you know, which and speaking of that, actually, when Vanderlei Silva and I trained with him, uh, we talked about this position and oddly enough, you know, which I, I didn't ask where he learned it. Maybe he learned it from Randy because they're all in Vegas, you know, maybe not. And I, they all train together. It's not, I'm not saying anything weird he likes to go from like kind of a uh, high crotchish area from there, right? So he'll have an underhook, drop down the underhook on the back side, front side comes under the crotch and he lifts them up. And, and you and you saw, that's why I give it credit to Randy Couture. You saw Randy Couture do that all the time, right? He would pick them up, even if it's a inch or two and dump them on their head from that position. But you can't necessarily – you can and you can't necessarily do that from holding the deltoid. It's easier to do if I had a different kind of underhook, right? Yeah, you have to almost go underneath your shoulders high versus that. Because you have the weird angles. You have to drop down. If you drop down, you're pulling that with you. So, yeah. Uh, 
It, it just hasn't been falling out. You're on your spot of what your objective is, you know. Yeah. What your um, Which it kind of goes back to head control. Um, and you did a good job teaching your head control. Um, you can almost never stress that enough, right? Where the head goes, the body goes. So if you're, if you have the underhook, rather it's a deltoid control, underhook low, underhook mid, wherever it's at, and your head is doing what you said, um, and you're pushing their head away, you're probably safe at that point, right? Too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which is awesome. So that, and the only reason I bring that up is you did a good job teaching it. And it's, it's something that, unless a guy's a wrestler, like most of the things I've learned from here are from straight from wrestlers, right? So unless a guy's a wrestler, they don't understand head control because you can have an underhook and have the angle, meaning you're off to the side and you can control pretty well, right? I think the head is the missing, the missing key to everything because um, and, and that's what I tell people at gym, at my gym, sometimes when I do a sweep, it might not be the best sweep sometimes, uh, but if I get my head underneath yours, I'm going to, I'm going to defeat you. And I always go back to football. I'm a football player. Um, if my head's lower than yours, I'm, I'm going to tackle you. If I'm an offensive lineman and my head's lower than yours, I'm going to block you typically. Right. So that's kind of what so I'm talking about, like an MMA or whatever. Yeah. I need to get my head below yours, dominate that midpoint and then I'm going to control that game. So you're doing, I mean, you know. That's I'm, what I try to emphasize. Yeah. To make sure, because, like, if, if I'm in there and he gets his head, head down to mine, right, I'm, like, my back, you can see, like, it's pretty much straight. I'm going to push backwards. And even if I'm trying to high pressure, I'm going to hurt myself more. And it's all his way coming forward. And I really have nothing here. And all he has to do is follow my head. And he's keeping me from being able to, so I have nothing. Whereas, <laughs> So that's a good point. So um, that brought up a good point that I was going to bring up anyway. So we're big on concepts, right? All of us, that's, that's as a team, uh, all united, all of our teams combined. That's what we've been preaching, right? The last uh, film session that we did, we talked about concepts. Um, my concept that I was going to bring up, and then you brought up another one was, if we were just going to be simple, um, head control, right? So you put your head under his chin, you've got control. Because literally, like, the same thing you just showed, what I was going to say is when his head was under yours, even if he was terrible, um, and he's not, he's a, he's a badass, I don't know him, but I'm going to tell him he's a badass because he's trained by you, but um, he could have just yeah. ran across the gym and you probably would have fell over because his head was under yours, right? He could just football yeah. tackle, right? Like high school football tackle, he wouldn't. So that's one kind, right? Head under, head control, whoever, you know, where the head goes, the body goes. What you just said about the hips, let's elaborate on that a little bit because that, that's a good concept too. Bring out what you had, what your concept is about. You're like, well, his hips were higher than mine, blah, blah, blah. You know, go ahead and elaborate on that. So essentially, you know, we're talking about the hip stuff, but if his hips are lower than mine, I'm kind of screwed. Um, so just like... Um, when I, when I get lower than his, right, so his legs out, and even if he's in a deep stance, when, when mine are lower, okay, that means that his center of gravity is above mine. So typically our center of gravity being at our hips, you know, so what works right here is you're basically using their body almost like a pendulum over top of your own hips or your leg. So which is why I like having my leg inside. So I'm kind of using this. So when my hips are lower than his, I can use this to tilt him a lot easier. Okay, so I have a lot more power, even though he's bigger than me. So when my hips are low, it makes it harder for him to be able to control his balance because I'm way lower than him. Um, and, and that's where his center of gravity is. And pretty much wherever my hips are going, you know, my head's going, my head's going this way, my hips are going. Right? So as long as I'm staying up under here, um, where his hip line is, I've got way more of an advantage because in order for him to try to control or grab my legs, he has to get down lower. Right. So as long as I'm down here, even if he tries to stretch, it's going to be way difficult, right? But if his hips get lower than mine, now I have no defense really because all I have is you know maybe some messed up at this point, and I, you know I'm not going to finish it that way, uh, especially if he's going to take me up his lane. Um, 
So any take that I do, it, I've got to get my hips lower. You know, even even when I'm talking out, like we're in our duck under or anything like that, or our control, I still want my hips lower. Because if I'm high, you know, again, he can take me up or just move me at this point, right? So as long as my hips are low, it's going to pull his body down even further. So I'm controlling his whole body by that. Right, our, our hips are what's basically what ground us with everything we do. Um, and if we're not controlling hips and we don't keep them than theirs, then we're going to lose all that momentum that we had by controlling them. Yeah, and really, when I'm watching you guys do, like it can it combines two concepts, right? If you're keeping your he hips lower than his, you're essentially keeping your head lower than his too, right? Um, right. So roundabout, without even thinking about it, you've combined two concepts. Because typically, one of the general concepts I tell people, if your head is lower than the other guy, if we're talking jujitsu, you can sweep them, right? Um, which is the same. It's sweep in a jujitsu, in a stand in a takedown, is kind of similar, right? If you're able to get your head below those, and that's essentially a wrestling shot, a jujitsu shot, is your head's below them, you have control of the guy now because if I shot in, the guy bends over, now his head's over top of mine, he's top heavy, blah, 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 it's easier to take him down. So really the hip concept and the head concept kind of go hand in hand, so um, good things. And the reason I bring that up is that's why we say, but concepts, like if, if I am um, clinch grappling with you or him, those are the things I kind of keep in my head. I think, where's my head position, meaning you know, I want to dominate the head position and then uh, where my hips at, where my, you know, it all kinds of goes together. Um, one, one other thing I want to ask you there is, so another important thing for takedowns, clinch, um, stand up in general, right, is creating an angle, right? So I think creating an angle is often forgot about in stand up because people just shoot for a leg not knowing that that's creating an angle. Like if I'm 50-50, um, you have a better shot of sprawling than if you came at you know, a little bit of an angle and tax that leg, right? Um, oh, yeah. So how compared to, so when you guys are, are kind of stand up grappling, 50-50, do you ever like to put your knee any other place than inside? Right, because if, if you go far on the outside, this is just a preference question, so it's not a right or wrong answer. If Because mostly you've had your leg on the inside, right? And you like that. How often would you put it on the outside to try to take, to get a take down, or is that irrelevant? What do you think's better? I think it depends on what kind of take down I'd be going for. Um, okay. You know, and, and obviously the body type, but you know, if we're talking the same body type, um, you know, for our, our single legs and stuff, definitely, you know, you're trying to be on the outside angle because I can't sit straight in and try to get a good one. Um, I would rather be, you know, when we we're, when, even when we're talking about maybe some uh, high cross types, you know, when we're shooting in, you know, when you're coming around, you're coming around to the side, we can be on the next over here. Because for me, any, any kind of downs or anything as far as like standard wise goes, I never want to be face to face. You know, I, I'm always trying to, you know, I, I always do the stuff like that, but, you know, I'm always trying to be off at an angle over here. That way, whether I'm pushing or pulling, um, what happens is for me is how your body moves. You know, you can lean forward and backwards right, at our hips, but to lean sideways, it makes it super difficult because we have limited flexibility. So any angle that we can create puts us in a weird situation to be able to be taken down a lot easier um, because we can't lean forward and back um, like we would, you know, lean into our left and to our right um, to try to stop what happened. Um, and as far as, like, if, I, if I'm doing, like, um, a knee pick or whatever, you know. Even even when I've got this single leg, you know, we're taught, you know, we're just going to tap this knee and we're going to run parallel. You know, I don't want to run back. I don't want to run, I don't want to run sideways. And basically, I'm just tapping this knee and walking, you know, um, because we it's way difficult to try to jump sideways. But you can always go forward and backward. And again, there's that leaning concept. Whereas if I'm pushing yeah. sideways, it's kind of like trying to strike sideways. You have no balance. 
you know, um, it's just it's really difficult and our body is in an odd position to be able to fight beside those things. Um, so being at that angle, you know, I always try to shoot on some kind of an angle. Um, I'll set everything up from the front, you know, like when, when I'm trying to get my legs inside, but I know how to see from this uh, point of view. So when I do um, shoot for the takedown, I'm not creating a T with my body, I'm creating that angle. So when I go to push him, I'm more at an angle this way, and I'm driving him kind of at an angle to the side instead of backwards or forwards. So I'm off to the side more or less with him, especially if I get in there, this leg comes up. So as I'm pushing him, we're kind of more at an angle instead of straight. So if I don't push straight, he's going back. So my angle is being more almost off to the side. That's a good point. So you use your leg to kind of off balance him if it's in the inside, right? Right. Okay. I, I prefer, That's great. Like I try to get him where they're over top of my hip. So when I, I want to get my hip clear up against the wall of the cage. So I don't want them to have any space um, on that side, like. Uh, okay. So just so I can kind of show, he's a little bit bigger for me to try to do. So like for me, um, when I'm doing that step inside, like I was saying, I'm trying to punch this hip as much as I can, pass her up against the wall of the cage. To make her basically pendulum over top of my hips, which what happens is, is that relieves all pressure off me, so I don't have to carry her weight and lift it, right? So when I'm in there and I'm driving forward, so the more I can get my leg up in here, so now I'm going, I'm just driving with my outside leg and all her weight now is caught behind this leg, right? So as long as my hips are here, it's making it way more difficult for her to try to plant this leg back down. As long as I'm leaning forward. Okay. So for me, the, the hip is a super governmental thing. And then once you start implementing the switch, so once you start implementing the head and the hip in with this, I'm going to push my head in, right? And also get my hip in. So once I get this hip in here, I'm pushing this head in. Okay. Now I can start either working where I can kick this leg and get this hip way up in here. And that makes it just way more uncomfortable for them. Yeah, it looks, um, it's uncomfortable. I mean, that looks like yeah. a tough position. I'm sure she's miserable. I mean, I have a slight counter of that that I like to do. Um, it's just a little bit difficult for people to try to catch sometimes. Um, like, if she's doing that to me, uh, so let's say, yeah. So, a lot of times, you know, they're in there and they're putting their hip in. So for me, what I'm trying to do is get this underhook out. So I'm not worried about this left leg of mine. Typically, I'm just trying to keep her hip from getting too far in. And I want to keep my right leg out as much as possible and my hips back, right? So my hips are back. And again, I'm trying to keep my hips down, which forces her to try to stay down more. So what I'm trying to do at this point is I want to feed and try to fight this, I want my underhook, and I'm going to throw it to the top. I don't care if it gets caught on my neck at this point. Right? So I just want this arm free. So for me, now I don't care because this, this is what happens. It's hard to see. So what happens is this. She's got this leg in here nice and tight, which for me, this is what works. Um, when she does that, I'm going to take my left foot, which is being out in front of me or her, right? So I'm going to actually pull it in and basically block her leg at the face wall, right? So I'm going to pull it in and I'm trying to stand up straight on it. So now I've alleviated the pressure off of myself from her pushing pressure on me. And when she does that, right, I'm going to use this as my advantage and wrap around. So now when I'm here, it, it's hard to do slow motion, but once I'm here, I'm going to get my gable grip, right? So when I well, not necessarily a gable grip, this is we wind up being more like a half hatch Ezekiel. So what happens is is when I get my arm here, as I'm rolling around her body, I'm coming forward and rolling. Okay. And we wind up finishing off with a little half. 
Sorry. But that's how I like to try to counter it because it's really all in, and that kind of goes to the fact of how you have to control the head and the hips so much. Because if she's not controlling the head and the hips of mine, then I'm able to push her hips down. So this is one time where um, having low hips might benefit me, but because if she's not applying enough pressure with this forward and I'm able to stay straight up, this is where it is going to benefit me. So as long as I plant my body and scoot my head back, then I can start fighting. So I've got my hand on her wrist where she's trying to pull my leg or my wrist control. So I'm this where I'm going to be fighting this. So I'm going to swim and get that. That's when I can shoot through. And basically, I'm trapping this arm at this point again and utilizing her own body to pull myself up. Even if I just get to this point, I can still finish my two here. So I don't know if you can see or not, but basically, oh, yeah, this is where it's good. It's good. So as she's reaching for that leg, I'm here and here, and we're you can rear naked or you know, where is he doing it at this point? Um, and you wind up rolling in that position. It's kind of like a weird, feels almost like a twister kind of because your body's in an odd position. Um, but that's how. Like one of, one of the ways that I actually try to combat against someone putting so much pressure on me against the, the wall. Over there. Well, that's almost why, like, sometimes I would think maybe having your leg on the outside instead of the inside would prevent the guy from getting hooks on you. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but, but again, that's, that's jujitsu, that's wrestling, right? It's give and take. Like, even a stand up, right? I, I know that I can throw an overhand right and land the punch right but the the risk is i step into overhand right and you hit me with your own right and knock me out right so it's a give and take i'm not saying anything is a hundred percent foolproof right everything and i guess that's how we, like kind of like what you said i don't like the underhook with grabbing the deltoid because of this counter you don't like it so you have another game so you have to take risk first reward on what your game is, right um i guess is the point um, oh yeah, so that's awesome. One one other, so <clears throat> just if I'm thinking off the top of my head, let's do, so that's again, awesome work, all of you guys, um, especially the girl sitting against the wall, beautiful. Um, but let's say, how about this? Um, give me two things, just as a fan of yours, a fan of everybody that you taught. How about let's do your signature scissor takedown that has probably zero to do with what we've been doing. But then let's finish it up with how to wall walk, how to get up a couple easy things from that, bring it tight back in. So a couple of two, two things, again, one may not have something to do with the other, but um, I would like to see um, just something you do from, like again, a takedown, a scissor takedown. And the most important thing to tie it in is we've been doing, we did all offense. Let's say that you got her on the ground. How does she get back up? So those two things, let's uh, do the best to kind of make them make sense and we'll go from there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, and that actually works a lot because, um, Matt, um, so I actually love doing the scissor takedowns um, because a lot of people don't expect it and it sets us up for leg locks. Um, Especially with the MMA, you know, it, it limits the striking ability of the other person. Obviously, we know with leg locks, it keeps their hands away from our head, right? So, plus, if you have a, a wrestler who's looking at, you know, single legs and double legs, it's a prime time to make it work. Um, so, and I know we haven't done a lot of single legs and double legs. So, I will attempt to walk her through it as well as we do this. So, um, basically, you know, don't pay attention to the single leg part. Uh, this is for uh, instruction, right? So if she was going for a single leg, you know, she was a wrestler. So basically, she's taking my leg, you know, and essentially they're hugging this leg, right? So both hands, you know, she'd be hugging in here and head down. Um, this is your typical single leg position where they'd be, uh, their legs might be a little bit closer. Um, so it just depends on how good a wrestler they are. Um, we're going to pretend she's an a living um, so she's going for the single leg and this is why i love doing it because wrestlers love going for that single leg and as soon as you're feeding that leg they, they it's like they can't help themselves other than trying to shoot for it so once they shoot for it i'm going to try and post on their head just to kind of keep myself 
a little bit of steady. And when I do it, I want to throw my left leg. My right leg is in great position. They done put half the move there for me. So once it's here, I'm just going to hook behind that opposite thigh on the opposite side. Now I've only got one thing left to do, and that's to drop down. Basically, we got to think about kind of like break dancing, right? So and if you want to do it slow, you can, you know. I'm going to take my left hand and put it on the mat and throw my, basically it's a, a step around, right? So I'm going to throw my hand on the mat, kick my leg back, and when I do, I'm kicking back past her knee, and then I'm going to pull my left knee behind her left knee at the same time. And what happens is, is this throws both her legs in the right position, right? So now I can wind up in, you know, 11, honey pot, whatever you want to call it. And at this point, we can wind up in a great position to be able to start controlling on this leg. So I'm already past the knee line, and this is great for me to start attacking, you know, our heel hooks, right? We're in a great position to start attacking at this point. This is why I like it because now I don't have to worry about those strikes as much because I can control them legs, control them hips, and focus more on what's happening here. So, now granted, even if we're not trying for single legs, but I'll still, I'll still attack with my single leg, even if it's just like out of the loop, just because they're not expecting it. So if we're striking or whatever, you know, and we may be up here, and I may faint something or whatever, so I want to get her head thinking up here, and I may throw something where my leg is going to come on the inside. If not, who cares? Um, objectively, I can even use her body to kind of help propel myself up underneath her. So as I'm coming in, right, I might shoot for, you know, we're talking uh, clinch work, right? So if I have head control, arm control, whatever. So even if I'm in here for clinch work, same thing, I'm just going to shoot up underneath and start for that assist or takedown, right? So I'm here, I'm jumping in and controlling that leg. And again, once we're in there, I want to control this leg high, right? So for me, I prefer to cross my legs. Everybody's different. You know, some people put their legs together and squeeze. I like to just do my figure four and try to control this leg to where I can push. So I want to control this knee out and control the knee in. So this is going to keep her from rolling left or right. This stabilizes this knee, keeps the knee right in the knee line where it needs to be, where she can't escape, and I can control by squeezing. Then all I have to do is focus on this foot at this point, right? Again, I've got my heel hook on the inside, my outside, right? So I've got both my heel hooks at this position. And then if she starts moving around, you know, she's kind of screwing herself at this point. But that's honestly one of my favorite things to do um, because I, I like to be ambidextrous with it and hit it again from different angles. So since I'm an uh, orthodox fighter, I typically have my left leg out in front and with your left leg out in front, this is where it gets interesting, right? So both of our left legs are out in front. Now it actually behooves me because my leg's already in a somewhat prime position because now I've got to create an angle. So I'm basically stepping backwards at this point, right? So I've got to create a, a little bit more of, or I've got to close a little bit more of the gap at this point. So even in here, um, I've got to be able to shoot this leg up in but this is why we like wrestlers, you know. Um, with wrestlers, if I keep that leg out there, obviously, you know, people here, they're like, I knew you were just trying to catch me with something because you're just feeding that, that leg there. And so typically they're not going to go for it. But, you know, in some situations, they're going to go for it anyways because what else is there, you know? Yeah, so as they're shooting for it again, same thing. I want them to shoot for it, and I'm going to make sure. So sometimes we'll have it on the outside of their body like this, which I don't want, um, then we're in a bad position. So all we, you know, just bend it, pull it in. Because look, if they have it out of our knee, and even if they've got it high on our calf, punch through, okay, I just push through, just like they got a straight look on us, right? Bend that knee, hook. <laughs> hook it back up underneath them. Then we can start controlling, right? Start shooting around. And then we start throwing our body. And you can go easy, right? Practice, get that knee up underneath, follow through. So just like any heel hooks or anything that's dangerous, um, it's something that can be practiced. Even with a newbie, they just have to understand the, the body 
uh, mechanics of it all. You know, not to shoot in at or below the knee, but your your thighs, um, your crotch basically has to wind up on top of the knee, above the knee, right on the thigh, right? So when I'm doing it, this angle, so when my foot is through and I'm here, so when my hand goes to the setup, so they can basically see. So as I'm going through, my crotch stays above her knee line. So when I'm shooting this leg and this leg, okay, my hips have to stay high so my knee can come behind her knee. So I'm pinching with my thighs. As I'm pinching with my thighs, it's going to automatically pull her left leg up. And so when I turn this way, I'm just creating a little effect. I'm putting pressure on that thigh, which makes her move backwards. And I'm trapping the other way. Um, so that's the basics of it. Um, obviously, better at it, you can do like jumping ones from far back and all kinds of cool shit. Um, we don't be afraid to practice it because it's really cool. Um, let's see, where else were we? Oh, yeah. So, uh, simple things off of working off your back up against the wall, right? So, and this, we, this works off of our wall drills a lot. Um, turn here. So, if, if I've got her down, like, and, and this is one of the drills um, we'll incorporate with our wall drills. So, we'll do like a minute here, a minute there, a minute here. And then we'll capitalize on that by also, so you be down on your side, up against the wall, right? So, you're down like this, so down on an elbow. So, basically, you know, you're, they're kind of down in this position. And for me, Obviously, the most dominant position for me would be knee on belly because obviously we got the wall there. Her back's more or less flat, either against the wall or the ground. So, um, me as a fighter, I want to keep her pinned in this area and not let her move in either either situation. So, once you understand which way they need to go to be able to control them, then you as a fighter on the bottom understands which way you need to go to be in the opposite direction, right? So, if I have knee on belly and I'm, I know my knee's not up, I'm trying not to kill her. But objectively, my foot's going to be up here. You know, I'm, I'm applying the front of my knee into her sternum, right, her ribs. So I want to use it like a spear, and I'm pushing, <laughs> and, and I'm trying to not put much pressure, right, without killing her. So I'm trying to dig in. So now what happens is, is obviously we all know it's uncomfortable, so our hands go straight to that knee to try to combat that off. <laughs> Right, so to get out of this position, right? So there's a lot of things you can do, right? So from here, obviously, you want to start controlling is now. You don't want to push this because you're just pushing it. So, what for me, okay? So, reverse it so you guys can kind of see me do it and have to do it, right? So, I'm in this position, she's got knee on belly here, right? So, I don't want to push it down because what happens is if I push it down. My face is still exposed, right? She can still hit me, and all I'm doing is I'm just putting my hand down in that situation, and I can get hit, right? So for me, the best thing for me to do is to push the knee out that way or try to control another leg, right? So I know it sucks, but for me, I like to control down here and up here, right? So I'm going to control ankle and push here. And here, so this is going to stabilize that knee and the ankle. So I'm going to push out, right? So as soon as I push, I've got to start wall, um, right? So we're here. I'm going to control that ankle to push out and start scooting my back up. So I don't know if you've seen, I know I went kind of fast, but once I'm here, just stay here. So once I'm here, obviously we're in a scramble at this point. She's got to keep her hips facing me. Trying to attack, you know, trying to get back to mount, knee on belly, trying to strike me. So you're going to pull that knee around this place so you face it anymore? Yeah. So at this point, obviously, I'm going to be taking hits. I've got a cover, and my first thing is I've got to get to this elbow, right? So I've got to come up. Okay. And I, I know it's a difficult situation because you'd be getting hit, but I'm trying to go out the back door. I don't want to go this way, right? So if I'm here and she's coming in at me, and again, this is where we can start using our underhooks and our overhooks, right? So if I'm here, I'm, just, I'm trying to wall walk back up, right? So if I'm here, boom, she's keeping pressure on me. 
So I've got to utilize this and scoot back, back away, back away. So I'm using the wall and I'm kind of using the pressure that she's putting on me to escape out of the situation that I'm in. Now, a different point of view, or, or a different way of doing this, it can be sketchy, right? But this also is effective, you know, it depends upon how good your jujitsu is. So if I'm here, I can start cave walking with my feet, but you have to be careful in which way I want to go and, and how I do this, right? So depending upon how they're doing it, okay, so I can push down and start getting my feet up the wall. So I want to start walking around this way. Look. Okay, so now I can start scooting away. Okay. So it depends upon how good a person they are, how many strikes you're uh, eating at that point. Um, so you get down. Oh, so you're, you're going to put pressure on my knee, right? So I'm pushing down, and you're going to try to get your head down and start walking your feet up and pushing outwards, right? So if I'm here, right, you've got to move your head quickly up underneath me, right? See, boom. I'm trying to follow you, right? Okay? And you've got to start escaping out in a way, right? Boom. So we have to utilize what we have, be in the wall, cage, um, you know, it, it, there's never an easy way of getting out of that kind of situation. Um, main thing is protecting yourself and knowing how the pressure is being applied and where it's being applied at the most. Like, obviously, the neon belly sucks. Um, the good thing about it being sweaty is it slides off a little bit easier. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, sometimes you're going to eat a knee because as they have neon belly, that knee might just slide up and catch you right in the chin. Um, it happened to me before. You know, um, it sucks, but that's the name of the game. But on, on the flip side, now if we're reverting back to um, your underhook, right, with your hook over top of their shoulder, this is where that actually comes to play really well because, <laughs> so if you go back down again, right? So if I'm here and I got my knee on belly, and I got my underhook, and I'm clamping on that shoulder. Now I can really drive it in because she can't use her arms to push me off. See, I'm controlling this arm, and it makes it really crappy for her. So you can't wall walk or anything at this point, right? So I'm, I'm able to control her a lot easier. Versus if I'm just up here, she can push that off, and I can slide. But if I have that underhook where I'm hooking, right? It makes it a little bit more difficult for her to try to stay at that point. But again, that's kind of one of those uh, scenarios where um, I may not use that in one situation. In that situation, it's, it's a very viable uh, thing to utilize it in. <laughs> but yeah. Well, yeah, you know, I'm sorry for the delay, <laughs> but that's, that's all uh, useful stuff. Um, which I, I like the takedown, which is badass, which I liked. Um, the wall walking. I th we talked about this before we got on. So this is what I want to talk about, getting up from the back uh, or from on the bottom versus a cage, right? It was a big thing in the Tito Ortiz, Chuck Liddell days, right? Meaning that that's why Chuck Liddell was pretty much uh, famous, badass, because you had to fight his game. Now, the reason was he was a successful wrestler, and most people didn't know. They, they, they knew of him for his knockouts and his knockout power and his backing up knockouts and his overhand right, and that's what they knew him for. They didn't know he was a wrestler. There's a reason that nobody could get him to the ground, first of all. Yeah. Then, obviously, by no one, I mean some people did. But if they did, they couldn't keep him down, uh, which was huge, right? And so that was the talk of the town. And then all of a sudden, I think everybody copied that game. Now you don't hear about it no more. It's either people get up or they don't, but it was just not talked about like it was. Um, and the reason I, so that doesn't mean everybody knows it. It might mean the elite fighters know it, but it doesn't mean that your amateur fighter knows it in West Virginia, your amateur fighter in Ohio, Pennsylvania, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. 
right? And knows an effective way. So I think that's important. I think we've almost overlooked that to a degree. Quit overlooking that, right? <laughs> Getting up is a science, right? It's not as easy as you think because for the guys that are good, they'll pull butterfly guard, they'll walk their back up the cage and they don't really get hit maybe once or twice. And that's, as a casual fan, you watch that and you're like, well, how could he do that? Cause he's not getting hit. Well, the difference is, look, I have two options. I can let go of his legs, let go of his body and start to strike his face, or I can attack his legs and attack his hips and try to take him down, right? And therefore, if I'm doing that, I'm not going to hit him. Uh, it's a different ball game, right? Does that make sense, Ryan? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I love using butterfly guard. Um, it's, it's a great tool. Yeah. I, I personally hate using closing arguments. Like, well, well, no, it, here's the thing. You may or may not like close, dislike closed guard for multiple reasons, but you're right. So today's MMA is all open guard, half guard, right? Part of the reason is if I close my – so if I'm in the UFC, for example, or Bellator or whatever, but if I'm in a professional MMA on TV, if I close my full guard against you – they're going to stand us up because the guy that closes the guard, they're going to say, Hey, look, if you're not, if you're not uh, uh, trying for submissions, if you're not progressing, I'm going to stand you up. Right. So closing your guard looks like you're doing nothing. So the game of 1993 is gone. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, gone. So, so the difference, I could open my guard and I could put my feet on your hips. However, what do I have if my feet are on your hips? Nothing really. I'm not gonna say nothing. I have something. Um, so typically, if I so if I put my hips on your if I put my feet on your hips, I'm probably gonna push you off and try to stand up. I e yeah. Forrest Griffin, Tito Ortiz back in the day, two fights, right? Yeah. Um, however, if I use a butterfly guard now, I can butterfly to X guard. I can butterfly to sweep. I can butterfly to anything, right? I I, I can push off, stand up. Um, so valid point, meaning that's why the game changed. It's not because closed guard sucks. It's because UFC is not, uh, it's not to say it's not MMA because it is MMA. Yeah. But if I street, if you and I got in a street fight, you can hold closed guard on me for four days because it doesn't okay. matter. Right. <laughs> and that was a good quote from Hoist Gracie in a long time ago. Hoist Gracie would say, here's the difference between a real fight and a UFC fight. If I told you, Hey, you guys are going to fight to the death, but I'll be back in five days. Come pick you up. Mm -hmm. This is not a direct quote, but it's a roundabout quote. Then all you know is you got to hold on for five days and you're going to get rescued. Right. But if I didn't tell you that I said, Hey, you guys are going to fight to the death. Then things change because there's no there's no end in sight right yeah. so now you take more risk you don't do certain things you don't hold closed guard because you're getting hit for you know whatever um people need to remember that there's a difference right yeah <laughs> sorry to keep cutting you off go ahead sorry. No, 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 you're fine, you're fine. I, I totally agree with what you're saying you know, the, the time limits the restrictions and the rules of the judges you know the the crowd, the ambience, everything is so much of a play into the fight and the dynamics of it. You know, you lose a lot of fights, you know, from the early 90s. Um, you know, stand up, you're not really doing anything, which, you know, in theory, you are. You know, you're the guy who wears off by trying to attack you, you know, which is why, you know, for instance, it looks like you're not doing much other than sitting and holding the guy, but essentially you're just waiting to strike. Um, so, yeah, like, I'm on the street, I'll, I'll pull rubber guard, I'll pull regular guard. Um, because a, a, a simple basic time will choke or an arm bar is going to be more effective than me trying to stand in the bank with the guy. But mm -hmm. again, if we're, you know, every situation is so different. Um, and I think that kind of goes back to how, you know, figuring out how you would fight it in before it even begins, you know. Um, is this a life and death scenario? Are we out on the street or is this just, you know, is it an MMA fight? Is it, you know, a sparring like kind of deal? Um, and I know we're supposed to train and the fight might be trained. Um, but every scenario requires a different set of, of thinking. Well, yeah, and you've done it. Yeah, I mean, so today we've we've kind of tackled um, some clinch work, some getting to the ground, some getting back to your feet, a little bit of takedown. So in general, as an observer, and obviously I know you, so it's not like I'm completely 
ignorant, right? You, I would think that anybody goes to your gym, they're going to learn. And here's the other thing. You're a high level competitor, meaning that you fought on pay-per-view, um, internet pay-per-view, you fought on EBI, you fought with some of the best people in the world you've, you fought. You've trained some of the best people, um, meaning some of your fighters are world champions or uh, regional champions and stuff like that. So from a small, the fact that, here's the other thing people need to remember, the fact that you can do that from West Virginia, uh, which is a population of, you know, your city, fuck, I don't know, 60,000, right? I don't know, let's, let's say 60,000. That's being generous. I live in the capital and I know 60,000, but so upon 60,000, then you got 1% that train out of that, that are healthy individuals. Um, the fact that you've done that with the odds stacked against you and the odds stacked against the people that you train with is amazing, right? So I think a lot of times people, West Virginia, Kentucky, some of these smaller places don't get as much credit as they deserve, right? There's a difference between taking a world champion in New York um, in Chicago, LA, and taking a world champion from rural West Virginia, uh, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee, there, there's a huge difference, right? You don't have that many athletes. There's no knock on those states. We're just talking, it's a, it's a densely, or right. not just a populated place where there's not that many people, right? Right. And, you know, and that's one of the things that I, I like to inspire the guys here with, guys in Galapagos. You know, is I try to, you know, instill it in them. I'm like, look, you know, you have, you have to understand if if I and, and you know people like that and stuff, you know, uh, we can go further than just inside West Virginia, you know, and, and make it on those big stages and stuff with what limited resources we have. Um, you know, that speaks volumes of not just me, not just you, but um, I I credit everything that I've done. You know, to my own surroundings of people because it's only them who have really made me better. Because you know, even though you know I may get to train um, every 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 other blue moon, you know, with you know a high ranking belt and stuff, but on a typical day to day basis, you know, when I'm training with these people, the same people day in and day out, you know, are quote unquote lower ranks. Um, I think that speaks high volumes uh, in their own retrospect, just because they're making me better. Uh, which in turn, you know, makes them better, you know. Um, so I, I kind of use that as an inspiration, like, hey, don't look at me, you know, look at yourselves. Um, and I was actually, I think it was two or three weeks, two, two weeks ago when we started on a podcast um, about how people were getting kind of discouraged about their progress and stuff. And basically what I, I try to explain to them is one thing is, you know, you, you always hear the, the new people coming in, whether it's their first day or their first six months, they're like, man, I feel like I suck. You know, and even people that have been here for a year, they're like, I just can't beat anybody. But you also have to look at the, at, at the progression of everybody else. I'm like, look, you're doing awesome. And no matter how much I try to tell them, they're going to still be like, dude, I suck. I lose every time. But I tell them, I'm like, look, you're only losing because everybody else is also excelling. Like, yeah. As long as you're getting better and they're getting better and we're getting better and nobody's getting any worse as the days go on, of course, you know, but when you start beating other people, that's when you've excelled past them. You're, you're really excelling past your own uh, skill level. You know, you're, you're excelling a whole lot more. Um, and, and it's crazy. And then once they understand that, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> Well, even like you said, once they understand it, it's a bit, but it's hard to understand because we all train together. Um, yeah, I'm not well, going to accelerate as a new student. You're my teacher, right? In order to beat you or compete with you, I'm going to have to accelerate leaps and bounds because I can't take away your, let's say, 30 years of martial arts, right? I, that's about, I, I just know when we were talking about the other day that you had whatever, 30, let's say 30, right? Yeah. I can't erase that 30 years. I can't. It doesn't mean I'm not getting better. I can't erase 30 freaking years. And I can't make up 30 years in six months or a year, right? Well, doesn't mean I'm not getting better. And that, and that we talk about that in our gym a lot too, right? That, that's why I encourage people to train with other people. It's to the contrary. So if your gym is a gym that doesn't encourage you to train with somebody else or scared that you train with somebody else, then your yeah exactly your gym probably yeah. is suspect. <laughs> so yeah. because 
the reason I say that is like, those people are afraid you won't come back because they're gonna be like, man, uh, that gym's a lot better than us. I'm gonna switch gyms, right? My, I'm a, I'm not afraid of that. I'm a, I think that you look. Somebody from my gym could go to your gym and like, man, I love what Ryan has to teach. I think blah blah blah. Right. But I, yeah. I'm, yeah. I don't feel inadequate. I feel that. Yeah. I'd say yeah. He's the man. Um, you know, oh, let's yeah. build off that. I mean, we've been in a situation where for the longest time, there's like never a small guy. You know, there's like me and Matt. So we were all like 160 and below. And all of a sudden, you know, we get these guys that are like 250, 300. And they're kind of sitting on the corner by themselves. Nobody really wanted to roll with them. And we had, a, you know, a partner gym up there in Maria. They're like, hey, there's some bigger guys up there. I'm going to hang out with them. And I'm like, hey, by all means, you know, don't let me stop. Because there's only so much my 135-pound body can do. You know, I can be technical, but I'm not going to house spring and I'm yeah. not going to outside. You know, that's. No, uh, and that's a good point. I had the same point from the beginning of time. Uh, I think we talked about this on another podcast or just, you know, whenever we got together. But, you know, I trained a fighter, Bill Dexter, uh, that was about your size and the same thing. So he ended up being a Muay Thai world champion, uh, fought in Thailand. Um, won numerous lightweight champions and the reason i'm bringing obviously i'm proud of that but the reason i bring that up is because it was the opposite well no it's actually the same but not the opposite we didn't have anybody his size um and so it was a detriment so i knew as a coach i told him i, I didn't pretend i said you need every opportunity to train with somebody your size and here's why uh, you're yeah. sparring with me um and what you get from me is not speed i'm 240 pounds right so what you get from me is power. You get from me a slow mf -er, right? You get, so I'm, I'm good. I'm good for a heavy, or I was good. Um, or I was average, let's put it that way. But I was not 130, you know, he's a world champion. He was, he definitely was. And, and the, what we did though, is I didn't sugarcoat. So, so as a trainer, I said, look, here, here's the thing, Bill you're not I don't have the speed so you're gonna have when you get into a fight so let's say that he fought you for example he didn't get ready for the speed right he wasn't used to it however I instilled into him the confidence that hey those guys are not going to hit as hard as I, as I do right yeah, and, totally. and so that was good enough for him that he was like I don't think they can knock me out I've been hit with you as hard as you can and you're 240 pounds I'm no Mike Tyson by any means but you know, there's a hundred pounds difference and I am skilled. And he was like, look, you've hit me as hard as you can. It's hurt. It's almost, you know, you know, stop me for a minute. I'm just not afraid. And so he took that no fear and he fought with a reckless abandon, much like you do. Right. And he won numerous world champions. We overcame the lack of small people. And then even on top of that, look, here's the thing. I encouraged him at that time. If you find, if, if you were around at that time, I said, man, train with Ryan, right? Because because in the flip side, I had two or five people. Billy Ash, A. Ash was one of them. I said, hey, man, Rich Franklin is your guy. He's two or five. Go train with him instead of stunning their growth, right? Say, so, hey, go train with that guy. And Rich Franklin, obviously, another team. Um, but on, on the flip side, Rich Franklin was a cooler guy. Gave oh, me yeah. more credit than I ever deserved. I'm a nobody. I remember even wrapping the, uh, my fighter's hands and Rich Franklin was doing a better job than me. And he's like, hey, but you can do it if you want. And I was like, fuck no, Rich, you're the man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I didn't pretend like I'm better. And you shouldn't. Your co if you find yourself with a coach that is out of his league, look, there's no harm. But what the harm is that he won't admit that he's out of his league. And look, I'm not saying I was out of my league. I think I was a great trainer. What I did miss is a bunch of people like you for my 135-er, a bunch of people like you for my 205-er, you know, that were 205. If you don't have that, if you're a good trainer, send them elsewhere. Yeah. If you're a good coach, they're going to come back, right? And that's how I think you are. Uh, look, man, Matt, Matthew Tennant, uh, Stephanie, you know, look, here's the thing. I get punched in the face for a living. I can't remember his name, but all your fighters are awesome. I know them just because they go to seminars with me all the time you've done a great job and that's more look what we've done as fighters is great um but what you do as a coach is way better i'm more proud like somebody could look at me and say uh yeah butch didn't win ibjjf as a black belt or brown belt or whatever they want to say you know maybe 
this or that. They, and that's 100% true. You're right. And I quit competing early on. However, my fighters have, and I'm more proud of that than I am of anything else. I'm, you're probably the same. That's why we're friends. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I love, I love, I get more enjoyment um, for, for, it's not even, you know, it's crazy because I, you know, um, JP Colvin, he knows me really well from all the fights that we do together. Um, and typically, you know, it, even if I only have one fighter that's fighting that night, you know, he'll look at me and be like, hey, you know, can you corner like these 10 other guys? I'm like, okay, but it's crazy. Even though they're not technically my fighters, um, you know, going in there and just being a part of what they're doing, um, and helping them to showcase, and, and even if it's just, you know, these little pet talks and stuff, I get more out of those fights than my own fights. Like, I can go and I'll fight, you know. That's like, yeah, okay, well, here's my money. And, I'm done. and so, great job doing that. I appreciate it. I appreciate everything you do. Everything that you've taught is fantastic. I hope everybody appreciates it. Um, thank you for sharing your, your gifts with me um, and everybody else. So, thanks a, a ton. Yeah, definitely. Man. Thank you. Um, I just like to do it and uh, like the opportunity. So, yeah. Well, you got a cool haircut, a cool beard, some cool clothes. So, <laughs> so <laughs> today's my day of trying to be weird. But anyway, good job. I won't keep you. That's uh, two hours and 43 minutes, roughly, because I was a little bit late. Um, let's try to make something out of this. You guys have a good night, man. I appreciate everything. If you need anything at all, just shoot me a message, man.